Uh, greetings. Welcome to the Battle of Homestead Foundation's 2023 program series. Tonight, we'll dig deeper into the fertile soil and industrial history of our region. Uh, we'll uncover, uncover uh, important stories about a period in which our grandparents and their parents uh, lived, and we'll reflect on how their stories shape our lives and our futures. I hope you'll excuse me because we had Tammy a year ago, and I looked back on my introduction to her, and I like it so much, I'm going to do it again. I hope you all don't mind. But our guide is the incomparable genealogist, historian, and writer, Tammy Hepps. Three things about Tammy. One, she's a technical wizard, Harvard graduate in computer science, in-demand consultant, and software developer. Two, she was a New Jersey girl, but now she's Pittsburgh's adopted daughter. Uh, drawn here 10 or more years ago to research her grandfather's family in early homestead. She's uncovered and produced a wealth of new artifacts and stories, greatly enriching our understanding of the lives and struggles, not just of one ethnic group, but all of homestead in light of the views of one ethnic group, which is a incredibly new perspective. And uh, we are greatly enriched in our understanding the lives and struggles of the people who built our communities. Three, she's a person of keen social conscience. Tonight's event spotlights critical issues about industrial development and community and family struggle for survival uh, in the Steel Valley. Uh, there will be a question and answer period, as Suzanne mentioned. Everyone, please write out your questions or comments and post them on the chat. We won't be able to get to them all, but we'll do our best in the time allotted. Uh, program chair uh, and committee chair Suzanne Donsky uh, will, will uh, monitor, mo monitor the Q&A and Nathan Ruggles will curate the questions for Tammy. Uh, let me briefly tell you about the Battle of Homestead Foundation. Uh, our founders were inspired by the dramatic labor conflict of the 1892 Battle of Homestead. The nation's eyes then were on the strong steel union, the amalgamated that had built powerful alliances with the community in the region and the non-union immigrant laborers in the mills. And while uh, the epic struggle uh, for the union to maintain its union and its high wages and working conditions and its contract that, it, that had those, and while it ultimately, while the union was ultimately defeated by the monopoly steel coal empire controlled by Andrew Carnegie and his henchman, Henry Clay Frick, we dig deeper to discover and celebrate the seeds of hope and that resilient worker and community struggle. Our organizational mission is to grow these seeds of hope by promoting a people's history, but also we work now to empower today's workforce and build strategies for a future that benefits all working families in our nation. Our goal ultimately is to develop a regional center and institute for labor history and the future of work. Our program includes public panels, historical commemorations, concerts, and drama, and they're now presented live and online with publicity generated through social and regular media. So our values are, we value the dignity of work, we celebrate labor's rich heritage and its pivotal place in society. We advocate community engagement through programs and partnerships. And we work to build human rights within a robust democracy. Come join us. There we are on the sign. More about our exciting upcoming programs in the wrap up tonight. Uh, now I'm delighted to give the mic to Sister Tammy Hepps a dynamic speaker as well as a dynamic writer, an activist and educator who understands and values the progress of humankind 
when working men and women join together in the communities, speak for themselves, build alliances where they are with allies, and if necessary, cause good trouble. <laughs> Tammy? Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm just going to start by sharing my screen here. Um, uh, can you confirm you can uh, see things all right on your end? Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much for having me. It's a real delight to be back to uh, speak at one of my favorite organizations, not just in Pittsburgh, but throughout all of my affiliations. Um, I've really been uh, proud to be a part of the Battle of Homestead Foundation for almost as long as I've been working on this project and to have made a lot of friends through the group and you honor me tonight by uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, my specific research into the Jewish community and the ways that it connects to the goals of this organization. So most people, uh, when they come to study Homestead, they come to see how the great themes of history have played out in Homestead. Labor, industry, union, capital, steel, technology, government, but as John mentioned, I didn't initially come to study Homestead for any of that. I wanted to know how people lived in Homestead. And the reason why is because four generations of my family lived in Homestead. And so yes, like many of you, I read about Homestead in my high school history textbook, but I wanted to understand what it really meant to be from this famous place. There are lots of former industrial towns in Western Pennsylvania that once had thriving Jewish communities. It just so happens that the one that my family is from is the one that people from all over the world have been studying for more than 125 years. And that, as you will see by the end of my presentation, is what transformed my initial motivation for reconstructing this history. As Probably many of you know, uh, Homestead's first deal was produced in 1881, uh, March 19th to be exact. And from the beginning, Homestead's mill was the most modern steel mill in the country, even before Andrew Carnegie bought the mill in 1883 and further upgraded it. During this time period, as the mill was getting off the ground, uh, workers were attracted from all over the country and even all over the world, including a growing number of Eastern European laborers who came to Homestead, primarily from what's today Hungary and Slovakia. And they were brought in to undercut the wages and demands of native born workers. That struggle was there from the beginning. And those Eastern European immigrants uh, were not well received by the rest of Homestead. But I want to talk about a different group of Eastern Europeans who arrived from the same places to Homestead in this time period. And that, of course, is the first Jewish residents of Homestead. So the first uh, documented Jewish resident of Homestead moved to town right before the steel mill opened. And he opened a business that was well suited to all of the hardy workers who were porting into town. He opened a saloon and his name was Abraham Skirball. Uh, that said, I am sure that there were Jewish peddlers who were running around Homestead throughout the 1880s and probably in the previous decade before the mill opened as well. Um, peddlers in Homestead were not treated, were not treated well in this time period. Um, they were teased, they were swindled, sometimes they were attacked. Uh, one man, Meyer Grinberg, was, quote, just a very small man, his son recalled. Quote, they used to call him all kinds of anti-Semitic remarks, and he just couldn't take it. Another young peddler, Joseph Lastusky, was arrested further up the river for peddling without a license. The newspaper said that he, quote, begged piteously with the police officer to make it up. So these were some of the first Jewish people to pass through Homestead. As for the settled residents in the late 1880s, the Skirballs were joined by a second Jewish family, the Segelmans. Uh, Ralph, the father of the family, was a skilled watchmaker. Uh, more Jewish residents arrived at the very end of the 1880s. Uh, that's the time frame in which my great grandfather arrived from Hungary. And they established themselves in the immigrant neighborhood called the Ward, which remained at the center of the Jewish community for decades. They largely started out, as I said, as peddlers, uh, they opened groceries, uh, they small businesses, and they catered to newly arrived laborers who came from the same places as they did and spoke the same languages. So as we head into the early 1890s, the number of Jewish people at Homestead grew almost three times uh, before the strike. 
It's worth noting that uh, except for one person, um, they did not work for the steel mill. They came with skills or community connections that gave them other economic opportunities. And anyway, anti-Semitism in the mill uh, largely cut off that employment possibility for them anyway. Uh, that's not to say that the Jews of Homestead did not depend on the mill. Everyone in Homestead did. Money from the mills was how most families earned their income, and that's how they could pay for the things that the merchants sold. So when I look at the famous Battle of Homestead in 1892 then, my focus is on the town and all of the townspeople who went through it together. While it began as a dispute between the steel mill and the union that represented a minority of the mill steel workers, no homesteader emerged unscathed. I'm not gonna go through the whole history of the strike right now, but after the famous events of the day long battle between the Pinkertons and the union members and the townspeople, the town was put under martial law. And this is a famous photograph of the militia walking, uh, marching on the hill where the library now is. And this is a photograph that people look at often um, when they're talking about how the strike played out. And most people see what's in the foreground of this photograph. They see the soldiers and they see the encampment. But this is what I see. Uh, this building with the arrow is the Boast Building, which was the headquarters for the Union, as well as for all of the out of town journalists. But what I see is that next door was the clothing store of Levi Myers. And next to that was the building where Abraham Skirball had his business. And on the street that you can see the beginning of that was where the Jews lived at that time, including my own great grandfather and his brother. And then across the street uh, from the Boast building, I see the clothing store of Isidore Grossman. So at that time, there were more than 60 Jews in Homestead, and this is where they were centered. This is where they lived, and this is where they worked. Here is a famous drawing of the Union headquarters, a little bit closer than that photograph shows, again, uh, where the arrow is. Um, and here we see a man shaking hands outside of his store, and I look at that man and I wonder, is that Isidore Grossman outside of his store? So look, Jewish people scarcely figure in histories of Homestead, and we're going to talk about why tonight. But as you will see time and again, the evidence for their presence is right there in the pictures everyone is looking at, in the narratives that people are telling. If only people know what they are looking at and what they're hearing about. The Battle of Homestead wasn't about the Jews of Homestead, and I'm not trying to suggest otherwise. Just before the battle, Homestead's weekly newspaper pronounced, it is not the 4,000 workmen alone who are affected by the lockout, but the 10,000 inhabitants of Homestead. This quote is, for me, just as much of a touchstone as the previous pictures for the stories that I'm trying to reclaim and the disconnected narratives that I'm trying to reconnect. As the strike dragged on through the summer and the fall, the town had to organize charitable efforts. Some local merchants protested that they shouldn't have to give themselves since they were already selling on credit to men who were not working. Other merchants were happy to contribute. To be fair, the temporary addition of 6,000 militia men to Homestead's population did benefit many merchants for a time, as did the growing number of non-union steel workers who took the jobs of the striking men. And you can see that even before the strike is over, we see these diverging destinies of these two different employment groups. This isn't just to talk about what happened in Homestead, though. It's about how people talk about what happened in Homestead, about how they only talk about some of what happened in Homestead. The truth is that that narrowing of narratives happened pretty early. Even before the battle, the Homestead works were world famous because of their technology and their output. Outside of Western Pennsylvania, Homestead was, was metonymous for the mill. When the contract with the union ended at the end of June of 1892, the eyes of the world were upon Homestead, as their very newspaper noted. Observers understood the significance of the Homestead Mill and the significance of the union men to the quality of the mill. They recognized that the battle was, therefore, the climactic showdown between labor and capital. Journalists from around the world descended upon Homestead and reported on what was happening. Here is one example from Hungary where local readers were well aware that their own people were caught in the middle. 
And so in 1892, it was the most important steel mill in the world that became the scene of the most significant defeat for labor unions. And thus Homestead in this very early date became the place to which journalists, historians, sociologists, artists, curators, heritage preservationists, and labor activists keep returning when they want to check in on the ever evolving relationship between industry and labor. What got lost then and got lost in the beginning was the stories of all the other people in Homestead. As the diverging destinies of the merchants and the steel workers during the strike show, the economic possibilities in Homestead were more complicated than these flattened narratives led on. Let's look more closely at the experiences of Jews in Homestead after the strike. As Isidore Grossman's brother Ignatz reflected in 1944, quote, the famous Homestead strike of 1892 put Homestead on the map and in the history of the United States. Thousands of people were attracted to Homestead. Naturally, the Jewish people were also attracted. And by 1893, we had about 12 Jewish families permanently established in Homestead. In 1893, they had their first Rosh Hashanah or Jewish New Year services in the neighborhood firehouse. And then in March of 1894, Mr. Sam Markowitz was observing the yard site or the death anniversary for his father and wanted to recite a particular memorial prayer, which required a prayer quorum of 10 men, and he had difficulty in finding those men. Isidore S. Grossman remarked that it was a disgrace that a Jewish community the size of the one in Homestead should have no organized congregation, as his brother later related. And so shortly thereafter, in March of 1894, they organized their congregation with 18 charter members. The first president was Ralph Segelman, the jeweler. The first vice president was my great grandfather. And rounding out the first officers were a couple of men named Sam Markowitz and Isidore Grossman with the store across the street from the Bose building. They soon hired a rabbi and made their first attempt at organizing a Hebrew school. The Jews were certainly not the only ethnic group to organize their community during this time. There were new churches and ethnic fraternal groups forming in all corners of Homestead's increasingly diverse population. But all growth in Homestead slowed in the 1890s due to the panic of 1893. It was in the summer of 1897 that the mill finally resumed running in full for the first time in years. And then the steel mill expanded, additional industries arrived, including the famous Nesta Machine Works. And so it is no wonder that it is during this period that the population of the Jewish community truly began to grow. As this advertisement says, an army of 5,000 workmen means a population of at least 15,000 people. The grocer, the butcher, the baker, and a host of other tradespeople must be there to supply them with what they need. And a disproportionate number of the tradespeople who came to feed and clothe the workers continued to be Jewish. This all sounds very normal, but Homestead after the strike was not a normal place. Democracy and civil liberties and freedom of speech were gone. It was not safe in Homestead to talk about the strike. It was not safe to talk about the union. It was not safe to even question the steel company. Workers were being spied on by company agents to prevent unionism from returning. If you want to talk to Homestead, excuse me, if you want to talk in Homestead, you talk to yourself, residents said at the time. People who are blackballed from one steel mill were blackballed from the mall. Through two of the observers who came to Homestead after the strike, we get a view into what the town became. In 1894, a magazine published a 16 page heavily illustrated description of the journalist Hamlin Garland's visit. He spoke a bit about the town itself. He said it was as squalid and unlovely as could well be imagined, and the people were mainly of the discouraged and sullen type to be found everywhere where labor passes into the brutalizing stage of severity. It had the disorganized, incoherent effect of a town which has feeble public spirit. Such towns are American only in the sense in which they represent the American idea of business. But mostly he spoke about the work of making still steel and he introduced the contrasting themes of the hell and the heroism in steel making that carry forth to this day. He wrote everywhere in this enormous building were pits like the mouth of hell and fierce ovens giving off a flare of heat and burning wood and iron giving off horrible stenches of gases. Thunder upon thunder, clang upon clang, glare upon glare. Torches flamed far up in the dark spaces above. 
Engines moved to and fro, and steam sissed and threatened. Everywhere were grimy men with sallow and lean faces. The work was of the inhuman sort that hardens and coarsens. I watched the men as they stirred the deeps beneath. I could not help admiring the swift and splendid action of their bodies. They had the silence and certainty one admires in the tiger's action. It is a dog's life, one worker told me. Now those men work 12 hours and sleep and eat out 10 more. You can see a man don't have much time for anything else. You can't see your friends or do anything but work. The same magazine had a follow-up article the next month and in it, a young workman reflected, how do they stand it? How could any human being stand it? No one knows, they all die young. But it was Hamlin Garland's summation uh, that was both somehow both damning and inspiring. Upon such trail, he wrote, West rests the splendor of American civilization. At this point, the strike wasn't even two years past, but with reduced wages, increased hours, and no say in how they did their work, the results were already playing out for the workers. And yet even with these conditions, writers found a way to see glimmers of glory in the grimy men. When the steel industry rebounded at the turn of the century, the opportunities it created were shared unequally. The daily wages of the highly skilled workers at Homestead shrunk by one fifth between 1892 and 1907, while their work shifts increased from eight hours to 12 hours. The wages of the least skilled were below poverty level, even though they too worked 12 hour shifts. Sociologist Margaret Byington wanted to know how it affected these families. She spent a year living in Homestead and published her findings in 1909 in a lengthy volume. She wrote extensively about the ward, the poorest part of town where most of the immigrant steel workers lived and notably where most of the Jewish community was clustered together. She wrote, the level ground in the second ward cut off from the river by the mill and from the country by the steep hill behind forms a pocket where the smoke settles heavily. From the cinder path beside one of the railroads that crosses the level part of Homestead, you enter an alley bordered on one side by stables and on the other by a row of shabby two-story frame houses. The doors of the houses are closed, but dishpans and old clothes decorate their exterior and mark them as inhabited. The pump in the courtyard is one of the two sources of water supply for the 20 families who live here. In the center, a circular wooden building with 10 compartments opening into one vault flushed only by this wastewater constitutes the toilet accommodations for over 100 people. 27 children find in this crowded brick paved space their only playground for the 63 rooms in the houses about the court shelter a group of 20 families. Accumulations of rubbish and broken brick pavements render the court as a whole untidy and wholesome. This court is one of many such in Homestead. In addition to describing the public health crises running rampant in the town, she also spoke about why these conditions grew worse. First of all, uh, the tax gerrymandering. The industrial leaders split Greater Homestead into three different boroughs with Homestead, the one in the middle, having the smallest tax revenue from industry and therefore the highest individual tax rates levied on the poorest people of the whole area. That meant that there was not enough money to provide for the needs of the town. She noted also how ineffective local government was in Homestead. Whatever tax dollars that there were for projects, they were squandered on failed, expensive, and poorly man managed, if not outright corrupt projects. People in Homestead did not bother to engage politically. It was futile. And finally, she noticed that Homestead had become very famous for its vice. There were unchecked speakeasies. There were disorderly houses, as she called them, which were uh, euphemisms for uh, something more. And to be clear, these were problems that existed in Homestead. They were not in Munhall or, or in West Homestead. Uh, these were conditions in Homestead itself. And I mention them now because Homestead would be defined by all of these characteristics for decades. But it was against these conditions uh, that we must juxtapose the developments of the Jewish community. So the number of Jewish residents and merchants in Homestead multiplied heading into the 20th century. There were more than 250 Jewish residents by 1900 and steep growth thereafter. The number of Jewish stores in town multiplied. Meyer Grinberg, the peddler who was teased for being short, opened a store with his brother. So did Joseph Lastusky, the peddler who cried when he was arrested. And many more of their neighbors opened their stores too, as you can see from these ads, just a subset of all the stores that were opened in this period. And uh, these Jews were also recent immigrants who came from similarly humble origins. <laughs>
Over the course of a few years, the Jewish community was able to raise money to build their first synagogue building. In addition to dues for membership and selling seats, they also had annual balls uh, that were attended even by many leading non-Jews uh, who were their neighbors in Homestead. And these same uh, non-Jewish leaders attended the synagogue dedication as well. It was on Easter day in 1902. Uh, this list of synagogue members from uh, 1902 gives a picture of this community at its most auspicious moment. Uh, and if you look at all of these men, and you can see that they were all in trade. Over a third of them sold clothes and another quarter had groceries or were butchers. And at least six of them ranked amongst the leading merchants in town, uh, Jewish or non-Jewish, including the proprietors of one of the town's two department stores. On their first Hanukkah, the president of the congregation, Bernhard Gluck, gave a remarkable speech about how much the Jewish community was thriving just 10 years after the strike. He said in part, we love to praise our heavenly father for the success we have attained in this, our town, not at the Tice in Hungary, not at the Rhine in Germany, nor at the Volga of Russia have we erected our synagogue, but on the, on the shores of the Monongahela it stands, on a solid foundation, the gables high up heavenwards as a monument of humanity and brotherly love. We must not forget that our wealth and earthly possessions we have all acquired in this great commonwealth in this famous town of Homestead. We are all aware that none of us came to this town the possessor to any extent of earthly wealth. And now through thrift, industry and indulgence, we all have accumulated a certain amount of wealth and we all prosper in business. The rapid advance of that first generation of Jewish residents of Homestead is undeniable. In the early 20th century, merchants were extremely visible in a way that they mostly are not today. Shopping was largely local and walking down 8th Avenue, the main business thoroughfare in Homestead was popular recreation for the town's residents and drew people in from the nearby boroughs in the township. Most stores were named after their proprietors and so merchants became prominent beyond what you would think would be their social station. And so through their stores, the names of all these Jewish men became well known to their fellow homesteaders and gave them a step up to participate in civic life. In particular, Morris Frankel became Homestead's first Jewish councilman in 1907 after a couple of failed attempts with some pretty blatant anti-Semitism. And Joseph Lastusky uh, became the first Jewish person elected to the school board in 1906. He became president of the school board in 1910, and he was responsible for building the high school building. Jews attained other leading positions as well in these early years. The first Jewish policeman, Morris Fogel, joined the local force before 1902. The first Jewish bank director, Isidore Grossman, was elected in 1903. My great grandfather was the second. He was elected the following year. And so the majority of early synagogue members had stores like the ones I've been talking about. The town's newspaper called them things like well-known, progressive, and enterprising. Their businesses were first class, successful, and attractive. One businessman was eulogized as highly respected by all who knew him. He was a fair-minded man and made friends with all whom he came in contact. The newspaper thought about the community as well and said, quote, the Hebrews of Homestead as a rule are a class of people who do credit to the town. That's from 1901. And so the children of these families were advancing rapidly too. From the very beginning, the Jewish community's kids were graduating high school in a time when most kids didn't go to high school. Girls were going to teacher's college at a time in which most people didn't go to college. Uh, boys were going on to four-year college. Councilman Frankel's son went to Harvard in 1908 and then on to Harvard Law. And before 1905, there were a couple uh, homestead Jewish kids at pharmacy school and a couple more in medical school, all of these kids being immigrants themselves. There was a clear place for Homestead's Jewish residents to fit in. They could rise and they could even give back. In an age without a social safety net from the government or a proliferation of nonprofits, when the steel industry contracted and homesteaders lost work, the town's civic leaders were the ones who had to organize local relief efforts. And so the Jews as merchants had a chance to become part of the leaders who were organizing these efforts. It was an amazing integration opportunity for Homestead Jews. As you can see on the slide, one of the most significant efforts spearheaded by the town itself and later participated in by the Jewish community was the establishment of the town's own hospital. 
And the paper wrote about the Jews' contribution at this time, quote, if the other nationalities would only do as well, Homestead would soon have a fine hospital. The Hebrews of Homestead are showing themselves to be a charitable people. The way in which they are responding to the call for contributions to the hospital should put the other nationalities, including the Americans, to shame. This mention of other nationalities reminds us to again pause to note that their non-Jewish immigrant neighbors, their neighbors who worked for the steel mill, were then having a very different experience. It wasn't just that the low wages at the mill kept them in poverty. To the extent to which we can perceive the town's newspaper as reflecting public opinion of the day, no English speakers at Homestead could escape the regular reminders that the Eastern European immigrants were their inferiors. The newspaper published many stories that purported to demonstrate that they were ignorant, unclean, violent, and drunk. And so we already see here as well, diverging paths. The xenophobia in Homestead unsurprisingly manifested itself as anti-Semitism as well. From the beginning, there was anti-Semitism in Homestead, though it was harder to put a finger on it. Some individuals from the, who lived here at the time later recollected that they encountered it often. Others claimed that they rarely did. I suspect each person's experience was unique. When the newspapers wrote about Jewish peddlers running into trouble, was it because they were Jewish or because they were vulnerable? When a three-year-old boy was hit with a rock, when an older boy was hit with a brick, when a grown man was beaten up, were they singled out for being Jewish? When three Jewish boys were tricked into missing their high school graduation dance, were they targeted for being Jewish or for being accessible to the pranksters? Was the attempted arson of the store of one of my great-grandfather's brothers anti-Semitic? Surely in 1904, when Dave Segelman got into an argument with a non-Jewish friend, when the paper claimed that the friend said, Dave, if I called you blank blank, I am sorry for it, before the friend knocked him out, surely the words the paper would not reprint were a vile anti-Semitic epithet? And what about when a political argument spurred an anonymous letter writer to call them all sheenies, a slur of the day, sheenies who were being used by the candidate that they supported? The most significant incident for consideration was the arson of the first synagogue building of which they had been so proud. Though the congregation believed the culprit to be, quote, an enemy of their race, the town would accuse the Jewish residents of destroying their own synagogue for the insurance money. This fire, though, gave them an opportunity to rebuild their synagogue on 10th Avenue in the area in which most of the churches were centered. They were able at that time to build a much larger building than they could previously. Uh, but in time, even this larger building would become standing room only as the community grew. At the same time, uh, the synagogue was not the only Jewish organization in Homestead. Jews wanted places of their own to socialize, to do philanthropy, to educate their children in Jewish traditions and connect them to other Jewish children. And so in these decades, at least a dozen new Jewish organizations sprung up and there were so many that they actually had to create an oversight group so they could coordinate all of their activities. So you can see in this bar graph showing the growing, Jew, growing Jewish population in these early decades, why it was that they needed a much better, better, bigger synagogue, why it was that the community could support so many organizations. You can see that in these early years, the growth was significant. But even as Gluck was extolling the success of the community in 1902, Many of the people that we see in this bar graph are actually a new wave of Jewish immigrants who are pouring into Homestead. And they were starting at the beginning. They weren't experiencing what Gluck was talking about. They were years, decades earlier in that journey. And some of these arrivals did find work in the steel mills for a time, but few stayed. Uh, most of them also followed the same peddling to shopkeeping path as their predecessors. And it was these newer Jewish families who lived in the immigrant courts of the Second Ward in those uh, terrible conditions that Byington described. So while some of the more Jewish, uh, more established Jewish merchants were able to move up the hill to the nicer part of Homestead, so that's below uh, the blue line on this map where you see fewer dots, uh, most did not. Most stayed below the tracks, even those who were prospering because they preferred to live amongst Jewish neighbors. And so these themes that I'm talking about that were established in the first decades of the Jewish community in Homestead, they, they carry through the history of the community, the shopkeeping, the focus on education, the development of specifically Jewish social and philanthropic organizations, 
the rise into the middle class, the inclusion in business circles, and the anti-Semitism along the way. So what we see by 1920 is a community within a community, the Jewish immigrants within the Eastern European immigrants of Homestead. And we see this community within a community following quite a different trajectory. Scholars don't talk about Homestead as a place where immigrants of this era thrived. And yet here we see that some did. They did if they did not tie their economic fortunes directly to the steel mill. Homestead in this era rewarded entrepreneurism much more than it did a capacity for the hardest kinds of labor. It is admittedly uncomfortable to look at these narratives side by side. It raises questions for both groups. It doesn't fit neatly into received narratives about Homestead, but it is what happened. Terrible conditions in the steel industry persisted. This history is known much better. Steel workers continued to be paid poverty wages and compelled to work 12 hour days. During World War I, the workers had production records again and again. After the war, the drop in demand led to attempts on the part of the steel industry to cut jobs and wages. In response, steel workers nationwide tried to unionize. The great steel strike of 1919 brought violence once more to the streets of Homestead. Here we see a policeman from the Cullen Iron Police beating a Homestead shopkeeper on the second day of the strike. But this time the steel company was in control of the narrative from the get-go and convinced everyone that the strike was Bolshevik. The strike failed in January 1920 and afterwards conditions markedly worsened in Homestead. With the Great Migration, Homestead was uh, becoming poorer. With prohibition, crime was rising. The fact is that living conditions in Homestead had never been great, and the perception in the 1920s was that the town was becoming increasingly unsafe. It is against this backdrop that we see the otherwise unexpected early peak of the Jewish population of Homestead in the early 1920s. So what was going on? For one thing, we can see just how much of the growth of Homestead's Jewish community came from immigration. And so when immigration to the United States was cut off for Eastern European Jews in the 1920s, there were not enough new people arriving to replace those who were moving out. And yes, the 1920s is when we start seeing the beginnings of the Jewish community of Homestead moving away from Homestead. And so there were push and pull factors even in these early years that led to Jews moving on. Uh, a, veterinar a Jewish veterinarian in Homestead uh, recalled in 1993, quote, it seems to me the problem with Homestead was not one kid ever returned. Once they grew up, they left Homestead, and as their parents grew older, they left the area where they died and nothing was replaced. Not one kid ever returned to Homestead. And just to clarify, he's talking about kids specifically in the Jewish community. And so it was education and marriage and job opportunities that were pulling away the Jewish kids of Homestead. But there were some serious quality of life issues in Homestead that provided the push for them. Like I said, poverty, crime, corruption, even water quality, these issues persisted and caused many Jewish homesteaders and many non-Jewish homesteaders to move away in this time period. Against the rising backdrop of nativism in the United States after World War I, the Klan became active in Homestead and the region in the early 1920s. And so while the feeling at the time was that they were more concerned with Blacks and Catholics than they were with Jews, Jewish families on their way to synagogue on Friday nights would pass them marching in full regalia. And as you can see from these photographs, the Klan burned crosses in the hills around the town. There was also more commonplace anti-Semitism. The children recalled that they feared to walk past the churches where they would be taunted or outright attacked. They were called a Jid, Christ killer, goddamn Jew. The teachers in public school would pick on Jewish students who didn't sing the Christmas carols or who took off for Jewish holidays. Homestead Jews from that period remember that their fellow Eastern European immigrants were the worst offenders. They brought their anti-Semitism with them from the old country. And in the US, their economic relationship with Jewish shopkeepers and landlords fueled their resentment. But in Europe, the Jew was always on the bottom, no matter how rich or poor. In Homestead, though, Jews were rising where non-Jews were not. It, up -ordered, it up ended the order of things. It was, in a way, the same old story with an American twist. 
It also happened to be that Homestead was and is directly across the river from the Squirrel Hill neighborhood of Pittsburgh, which was then a growing center of middle-class Jewish life and still is to this day. And so Squirrel Hill, to be clear, was a real pull for, for all middle-class homesteaders, Jewish and non-Jewish. But for Jews in particular, it had a draw that it was simply an easier place to be Jewish while remaining close to friends and family and businesses in Homestead. The departures from Homestead somewhat slowed during the worst years of the Depression. But even with the shrinking Jewish population, the Homestead, Homestead Jewish community institutions remained strong. And similar synagogue membership was, also, was actually growing in this time period. Um, a woman who was a child in this period remembered, quote, you do have to remember in the Depression years, the synagogue was a source of great entertainment and it was very central to our lives. They were difficult times and the entertainment all centered around the synagogue. Another woman from the same generation remembered uh, talking about her parents and their generation. Uh, this was their home away from home. They worked all day and they went home and they had dinner and then they would get together. They'd have a board meeting or they would have a special meeting for this or they'd have a seat committee meeting or it was always something, but it was always the synagogue. That was the hub. There wasn't television and you knew you read your newspaper, you listen to radio, but there was always something going on at the synagogue. The depression was significantly worse in Homestead than other places. 50% of Homestead steelworkers were unemployed and those who were employed only worked part time in an attempt to keep more men at least somewhat employed. But the depression made possible what had otherwise seemed impossible in Homestead. The National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933 provided for collective bargaining. The 1935 National Labor Relations Act, also known as the Wagner Act, required businesses to bargain in good faith with any union supported by the majority of their employees. On July 5th, 1936, the 44th anniversary of the strike, the union organized a big rally in Homestead in a renewed campaign to organize Homestead steelworkers. There was a reason why they picked that date and that place. A steelworker, Italian by birth, got up on stage and read the steelworker's Declaration of Independence. Like him, most of the men there were immigrants or the children of immigrants. They heard, quote, we are free Americans. We shall exercise our inalienable rights to organize into a great industrial union banded together with all our fellow steelworkers. U.S. Steel saw the writing on the wall. Nine months later, the union was back in the Homestead Works. On Labor Day in 1941, the Union dedicated a monument in memory of the workers who had died during the strike. Almost a half century later, the Union had taken back their own narrative. They could fearlessly tell the world what their history meant to them. But this climactic dedication happened right before the heart was ripped out of Homestead, when the whole lower half of Homestead, the ward, was demolished to expand the steel mill. The people of Homestead were compelled to vacate, Property owners were forced to sell at whatever price the government offered. 75% of them were renters about to be homeless during a countywide housing shortage. The displaced families largely did not protest. There was huge pressure on people to do their patriotic duty. Clergymen spoke in favor of it from their pulpits. One scholar called this a quiet sacrifice for the greater good, the greater good being America or the war, I suppose. But I do want to point out that America wasn't in the war when all of this got underway. In fact, demolition was well underway when Pearl Harbor took place. Jewish peoples we saw earlier had already begun leaving Homestead altogether. But you can actually see the drop in the Jewish community's population in the bar graph from when the ward was destroyed. The displaced Jewish households, like many of the ward's residents, had been there for some time. These were families with deep multi-generational ties to the town, including my own family, have still found a way to remain in Homestead despite the severe housing shortage. Two thirds of Jews in the ward had owned their homes, which was far more than the rate amongst their neighbors. And most of the ward's Jewish residents lost their businesses along with their homes and lost rental properties as well. And so when the government and the steel mill claimed Lower Homestead, they wiped out the progress that many families, both Jewish and non-Jewish, and especially families headed by first generation older adults, they wiped away that progress that they had made in bu building individual and generational wealth. On the other hand, Homestead Steel families, they were the ones who got something in return through the expanded steel mill. Permanent economic stability, or so it seemed.
The war brought record employment and record wages to Homestead. Unlike after World War I, production after World War II kept up. There was a substantial market for steel appliances, automobiles, farm machines, and more. U.S. Steel produced more steel in 1950 than it had at its wartime peak. The steelworkers went on strike in 1946 for higher wages. This time there was no violent confrontation and they got the wages that they wanted. U.S. Steel passed the costs on to the American consumer. Throughout the 1950s, the mill ran at full capacity and money poured into Homestead. At this time, the medium in median income of Homestead was 26% higher than the rest of the county. Eighth Avenue, the shopping district was in its prime. The stores attracted shoppers from all over Steel Valley, many of them former Homestead residents. On Saturday night, Eighth Avenue was the place to see and be seen. People dressed up and the sidewalks were thick with people. The stores on 8th Avenue continued to be run by Jewish merchants, though increasingly those merchants lived outside of Homestead and commuted in. You walked down 8th Avenue and it was a parade of Jewish names. Rubin, Linkoff, Grinberg, Gold, Wolfson, Hilk, Levine, Friedlander, Marx, Margolis, Half, Solomon. Through, though the years of the borough organizing its own relief efforts were past, these men and their fellow businessmen remained active in civic life. The fire chief was Jewish. There were Jewish mill cops. Even the assistant football coach at the high school was Jewish. In 1950, a Pittsburgh grand jury put an end to decades of vice and corruption in Homestead, which certainly improved conditions. And in another way, Homestead broke with its past. It remained, as always, a patchwork of different ethnicities, but it was less and less defined by its unassimilated foreigners. People of the same ethnic origin clung together still, but increasingly across ethnicities, they shared an identity as steel workers, union members, and homesteaders that flattened out the differences of the past. A couple generations of American born kids with Eastern European roots had come up in school together and then the mill together. For all the angst of previous generations of homesteaders about why their foreigners remained so resolutely foreign, that was all it took, opportunity and familiarity. But it got harder for the Jewish families that remained because there were fewer of them. They were more isolated socially. They didn't fit neatly in the evolving patterns of homestead life. As the steelworkers of homestead defined what it meant to be a homesteader according to their own values, Jewish homesteaders saw that they were out of step. They were a different community with a different outlook on what it took to thrive. Here's the thing though. While the Jewish population of Homestead was shrinking somewhat in the 1950s, its synagogue membership boomed after the war. The people I talked to today remember the bustle of activities in the 1950s and the 1960s. Some of those people are the kids in this picture. They remember a synagogue that was standing room only, a Hebrew school that was teeming with children, a, sister could, a sisterhood that cooked elaborate snacks for after synagogue services and dinners in the synagogue kitchen. They remember meetings in the basement of the synagogue for all different kinds of Jewish social and philanthropic groups and all different synagogue committees. So to explain what happened next, how it went from this heyday to decline so quickly, I gotta go back to that bar graph. And so here finally is the full bar graph. I've shown you some sections of it already showing how synagogue membership changed over time. So we can see here that synagogue membership peaked in the early 1950s, but as you can see, it dropped very quickly thereafter. The colors in this version of the graph uh, divides members by how they are related to each other. And these colors begin to explain why. So purple are members who aren't related to other members of the synagogue. These are first generation members who arrive without any pre-existing connection to the community. So you see how the purple grows and then shrinks over time? That's because over time, new Jewish residents just stopped moving to Homestead. So this is the same graph, but the colors now show where a synagogue member was living in a particular year. So blue means that the member lived in Homestead where the synagogue was located and red means that the member lived nearby in Pittsburgh. And so if you look really closely, you'll see that in 1950, the number of members residing in Homestead dipped below 50% for the first time and continued to drop from there. Although an increasing number of members were people who had moved away, leaving Homestead did not mean cutting ties. You can see this trend even back in the 1920s when Jews first began moving out in large numbers. 
So the impact on the synagogue of people moving away was delayed by an additional generation. A woman who was born in Homestead and who raised her own children there in the 1950s and 60s commented on why her friends moved out. They, quote, looked toward the future and knew that it had peaked in Homestead and for their children and grandchildren, they wanted a more Jewish environment such that Squirrel Hill or East End offered them. Quite frankly, they wanted their kids not to face anti-Semitism at school and to have other Jewish friends and to learn how to be proud of being Jewish. But one kid who did stay at this time, Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> Crucially, same as it was in the 1920s, it was not just Jews who were leaving Homestead. After the destruction of the ward and the expansion of the steel mill and increased wages and better roads and bridges and cars, steel workers didn't need to live in walking distance of the mill anymore. Increasingly, steel workers lived further out in nicer places and drove in. There was a crush of cars coming and going at shift change. The population of Homestead already halved from the destruction of the ward dropped 25% between 1950 and 1960, 16% between 1960 and 1970, and 19% between 1970 and 1980. Homestead was also concerned with the sharply declining number of stores. In 1954, which was still the heyday for the business district, there were a third as many stores as there had been in 1939. And with the total lack of intervention in the problem, the business district went into a terminal decline in the 1960s. Uh, a resident from this time remembered, quote, when I first knew Homestead, the stores were still very nice. The street was busy. That declined as transportation improved and as shopping malls were built. That's what hurt all these little towns. And as the businesses declined, the Jewish merchants left and the Jewish community declined. The steel industry started laying people off in the 70s and hastened the decline of Homestead and its people as a result. More stores closed. Arsons increased. As the steel industry declined, resistance rose up once more on the part of the workers and once again it was centered in Homestead. Homestead's local 1397 transformed itself into a militant local of United Steelworkers and resisted the dismantling of the steel industry. Industrial America was collapsing, but as always, journalists paid particular attention to what was happening in Homestead. And this time, steelworkers told their story alongside the outside journalists who came in. And Homestead Local 1397 was keenly aware of what it meant to be the local from Homestead. The eyes of the world were back on Homestead, and Homestead steelworkers were making headlines once more. Their efforts were innovative. They create alliances between labor and the community to fight for jobs. They made efforts to find investors to make it possible for workers to buy the mill and operate it themselves. As layoffs increased, they organized efforts to support unemployed workers and their families. From 1979 to 1986, U.S. Steel alone in the Mon Valley alone eliminated 27,000 steelworker jobs. And in 1986, they closed the Homestead Works for good. Punishment, they claimed, for the locals' resistance. I'll quote Mike Stout, who was part of these efforts and published a book about them a few years ago. He wrote, for me, 1892 and 1982 are part of a whole, two points on the same pole of resistance and spirit of solidarity that sprang up, thrived, and was eventually suffocated at the great Homestead steel mill. The only way the Union flame could be permanently extinguished at Homestead was by pulling the floor out from underneath us, shutting down the whole thing and erasing our important historic contributions. The waning years of the Homestead works were the waning years for the Homestead Hebrew congregation. This ad from Pittsburgh's Jewish newspaper makes me sad. This once glorious community reduced to begging people to show up. Jews left Homestead, but Homestead did not leave their hearts. In 1988, a woman who didn't even grow up in Homestead wanted to be married in the synagogue that was so important to her parents and grandparents. The members spruced up the building for a final hurrah. But the building needed too many repairs and the community still had a cemetery to keep up. In 1991, they couldn't get a prayer quorum to commit to coming to the synagogue for the high holiday services. And so in late uh, 1992, they found a buyer for their building just before a slew of local Catholic churches came on the market. 
The Jews of Homestead may exist only as a diaspora now, but we Jews are good at diaspora identity. For us, the name of the town still brings a smile and a rush of stories. Jewish families still come back to Homestead to see where their family's American story started. And the community still keeps up the tradition of cemetery visitation in September before the high holidays. The closing of the CML in 1986 brought a renewed surge of scholarly interest in the town. Historians organized a museum exhibit in 1989 about life in the town. Accompanying the exhibit was a book about life in Homestead. The book mentioned Jews twice, once to quote Margaret Byington and once to point out that the town's lead racketeer, Joe Frank, was Jewish. The entire Jewish community in Homestead was reduced to its most notorious member. Somehow, this book had an entire section on corner stores and saloons without mentioning any Jews, which is confounding. Somehow, the author reminisced about the, quote, once lively and prosperous 8th Avenue business district without acknowledging who helped to make it so. A few years later, the community came together to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Homestead. The New York Times reporter, who was responsible for the coverage of the closing of the Homestead Works, wrote a book about Homestead. Again, looking at Homestead as a place where people lived, not just a place where people worked. In this whole book, more than 400 pages, he mentioned Jews twice and the synagogue once, and that's it. He repeatedly asserted that Jews didn't live in Homestead, but in Squirrel Hill. He singled out the town synagogue for being, quote, hardly used anymore, that the same could have been said of many of the churches he named, a slew of which the diocese was about to close from declining use. He repeated, as you can see here on this slide, an anti-Semitic slur that was used against them. In a couple of sections about Homestead's main businesses during its heyday, he singles out 17 businesses, 11 of which were owned by Jews, although he didn't note that commonality. He talked about Club Mirador, a famous nightclub which had black and white performers and accepted black and white patrons at a time in which that was uncommon. That was Joe Frank's place, although he didn't say. Joe Frank, the leading racketeer, it was Joe Frank who brought those people together. My cousin, who grew up in Homestead, shared his feelings about this book in 1993. He said, quote, I was very unhappy with it, and so was my brother, because I really think he slighted us. There's the Katzes and a few other families left, but he didn't make contact with them. My brother was there, and there was quite a few families into the 80s, and so I was disturbed by that. He dismissed us, really, and we were an important part. These two authors follow in the footsteps of their predecessors. They center the voices of steelworkers and their families, people who had previously been silenced. They write from a place of working class solidarity, uh, the New York Times reporter especially, but their results are to flatten the dimensions of what Homestead actually was. The limited narratives about Homestead, as we saw, started in a period when steelworkers couldn't safely tell their own stories about themselves. And when they started telling their own stories, they began from the previous tropes that had been established. As to why those tropes persist even to this day, I want to offer a theory by way of a 1996 paper about Homestead, which tried to get at the truth of race relationships between black and white homesteaders. The authors of this paper reported that, quote, people we met in Homestead praised the town for its tolerance, conveying this through vivid images of a community without strife outside the mill walls. But after the authors spoke to black and white homesteaders who had quite different memories, the authors concluded, quote, the notion of homestead as tolerant can be seen for what it was, a hegemonic characterization embraced by white ethnics. It's very easy for people to paint one view of events when only one group is given a voice. The researchers then asked a question that is quite close to the one that I've been asking all of these years. Quote, why have so many observers chosen to avoid the issue of racism in Homestead? And their response, quote, part of the answer must lie with Homestead's reputation as a heroic working class town. To many, this town of strikes and manly workers creating steel in a dangerous environment represents the essence of workers in the annals of American history. Racism would tarnish the heroic image. I would like to posit that this heroic image stands in the way of learning all the historical lessons that Homestead has to teach us.
The heroic image blocks an honest accounting of all the economic opportunities in Homestead. It turns out that in Homestead, the surest way to find stable economic footing was not to tie one's fate directly to the mill. This is a hard lesson. The decades of union control where workers prospered alongside the mill were an exception. And the families who became, quote, almost middle class in those years, to quote a steelworker who was quoted in that second book I showed you, they were left utterly abandoned by U.S. Steel when U.S. Steel left. The heroic image blocks an honest accounting of support structures, who created them, who managed them. We can learn from the attempts at civic engagement and neighborly solidarity today more than ever. So that's my scholarly conclusion, as it were. But it particularly concerns me as a Jew in Squirrel Hill that the heroic image blocks an honest accounting of how people actually got along in a broken place. And it blocks a real assessment of who was permitted to belong and who was not, and when, and why. Homestead, through the way its history gets told, has come to symbolize solidarity, and yet there was both more and less solidarity than we tell ourselves today. There could be that solidarity again, and it's amongst this group where I feel the promise lies. The Battle of Homestead Foundation was created by many of the steelworkers who had been so active in those waning years of the mill from local 1397 and partner organizations, along with others who are inspired to use the vision of Homestead's history to better the world. This group has hung onto a vision of labor activism that is more expansive than just labor, that can inspire real social change. It is an amazing legacy of Homestead that people from this group meet every Wednesday for breakfast including guests who come in from around the world to breathe the spirit of 1892, to look history in the face, to carry forward its best and to learn from its worst. I'm honored to count the members of the Battle of Homestead Foundation as my friends and knowing all of you has transformed the work that I have been doing to tell my community's corner of Homestead history. Our mutual efforts to incorporate each other's narratives of Homestead reflected, I hope, by my very presence here tonight shows that history needn't be a zero-sum game. We can tell each other's stories. We can braid them together in narratives where the lessons are more complicated and the lines less clean, but where there is more to learn because the narrative is closer to what really was then and what really is today. So I thank all of you for having me. I thank you for listening to my stories. I thank you for considering them in light of your own. And I'll pause now and I'm happy to take questions and uh, engage in conversation with all of you about this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tammy. That's wonderful. Can you stop your screen share and then we can see your face? Thank yeah. you, appreciate that. Um, you've given us so much to think about and we have quite a few questions, so I'll, I'll start into it. Um, Philomena D. asks particularly, what brought your great-grandfather to Homestead? Why Homestead? Why not some other part of the country? <laughs> well, I can answer as much as I know. Um, and I've been at it for many years, so it certainly shows the limitations of what is rediscoverable. Um, my great-grandfather came from an area of Homestead, excuse me, of Hungary, uh, where there was uh, more tolerance for Jews than in many other places of Eastern Europe. So he wasn't fleeing violence, as we hear from many stories. Uh, he was looking for better economic opportunities. Um, and so he was the first foothold in bringing over then, you know, seven of his brothers and sisters and helping them to get established here as well. Um, why Homestead? Um, that is uh, a mystery that I don't know that I can ever quite answer. I believe that he was related to some of the Jewish people in Homestead who showed up before him. Certainly they were from the same regions in, uh, in Hungary. And so I think he probably heard from somebody that Homestead was a place that had economic opportunities. He knew somebody, so he wasn't going to be lonely. And so I think by that he found this town, he settled down and he saw enough here that he began to bring over his older brothers and their young families. He went back to Hungary to marry and then brought his wife back and they started the family here. And so that started off the, you know, the, the foothold in the US for that branch of my family. 
how old was he when he came? Um, he was in his early 20s. So I think of myself like graduating college and, you know, moving to the big city for the first time and what that was, but that is certainly not like getting on a boat to a place where you don't speak the language and probably having your whole family waiting for you to send checks back so they could help be supported. Um, so that certainly was quite a daunting thing. And of course, you know, all of these men that I was were telling you about in the early part of this talk, they all had that same responsibility on their shoulders. Right. Um, someone asked as well, what caused him to leave Hungary at the time he did? What do you know about his circumstances there? Um, you know, um, he he left at a point at which both of his parents were alive and he had two brothers and they were all grown. So at the time that he left, I have to think it was just looking for opportunity. Um, not long after he left, his father died and excuse me, his mother died and then his father remarried. And then the second family had a lot of very young children. And so, you know, maybe he didn't mean to stay here. Certainly a lot of the non-Jewish Hungarians meant to only come here for a little while and work and go back. So perhaps he had something similar in mind. But certainly once his father's remarriage meant that there were all these younger children who were his stepbrothers and sisters, it certainly made the motivation um, to, you know, make money and send it back all the more important than it might have been in that initial period. And was the Hungarian Jewish community primarily centered in Homestead or were they also elsewhere in the city? Um, this whole region of Western Pennsylvania, uh, Hungarian Jews settled all over the region. Um, same, by the way, as non-Jewish Hungarians. I mean, those narratives are intertwined. They heard about the opportunities of Western Pennsylvania from the same places. They just saw different aspects of it that fit their skills or their interests. Um, so Homestead was not a particular center. The largest uh, center for a Hungarian Jewish life, well, in Pittsburgh and also in McKeesport, um, so, um, but, you know, they were just sort of part of that larger narrative. And as you might have picked up on one of the bar graphs, if you were looking really closely at the colors, the community was about split between Russian Jews and Hungarian Jews. And I'm kind of playing it fast and loose with borders for those of you who really know this history, because it's going to get complicated fast. But it was about split between those, those two groups. And the fact that they only had one synagogue between them made for some interesting history. <laughs> Sure. Um, Al Hart actually asked that question when you refer to Hungarian Jews. Are we talking about Austria, Hungary? Where where are the border lines? Does yeah, it I mean, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm blending together Austria, Hungary, but um, you know, the sort of like the pre World War One empire borders. Um, but really, most of them are from what is today Northeast Hungary and now Slovakia. And a little bit from that like corner of Ukraine that kind of like pokes in there. Um, you really have to know your map to know <laughs> to know what I'm talking about with that. So, so the Hungarians were mostly from that region, um, not entirely, but predominantly, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as well, someone asked, what happened to the large synagogue on Tenth Avenue? Is that the same synagogue you're talking about? Uh, yep, um, I'm going to lean over so you can see it here. Um, the building still stands. Um, the can I see if I can point. Um, the Jewish symbolism on the outside is covered up by panels with crosses now because the building is used as a church. Um, but it is very recognizable. And if, as you approach the building, you look in the bottom right corner, you can still see the cornerstone, the original cornerstone, and you can see in it the year that you would know it, 1913, but also the Jewish year beginning with 56, because the Jewish calendar counts the years differently. So that is perhaps the most obvious sign if you're looking at the building, that you're looking at a building which originally had a Jewish identity. Okay. So, um... Molly Wilburn Cohen asks, were the members of the KKK from Homestead or from other towns, if you know? Um, I don't know a tremendous amount. They weren't necessarily super public about it at the time. Um, I think the belief was that it was a mix of locals, people from the greater township, which abutted Homestead, you know, perhaps members from further afield. Um, you know, there are no membership rosters that survive from the KKK of that period. So it's it's a little bit difficult to know for sure. I'll, I'll tell a favorite story of mine, if I may, just to show how complicated all of this was. Uh, the KKK was active in all of these steel towns. 
And um, one of the places where it was active was Denora. And so there was some sort of KKK event and they shot off their guns and a guy shot himself in the foot and went to his Jewish doctor and said to his Jewish doctor, hey, can you please remove this bullet from my foot? Here's how I got it. And his Jewish doctor friend did. So it goes to show that when people are living in close community together, it is quite complicated. Um, the ways in which hate and friendship play out amongst even the same people. Um, so I, I, there's, I, there's not a lot that I can tell you more specific than that, um, but certainly as you saw from the pictures, that activity did gather a lot of people and there was a lot of coverage of it in the Homestead newspaper at the time. How did the townspeople react? Was there any pushback against the KKK in those circumstances? Homestead was a place where people were not really taught to push back for a lot of reasons. Part of that is the aftermath of the of the strike. Part of it is people just learning from the way that work went at the mill and just in general in a place at Homestead just to kind of keep their heads down. So um, I'm not aware of any particular stories of resistance. I know you do hear about them in other towns in Western Pennsylvania. I'm not aware of anything in particular in Homestead. If it happened, it happened on a smaller scale. It happened amongst individuals. If there are others who know these stories, I'd be delighted to hear them, um, but they're not stories that I've come across thus far. Okay. Um, there was a question about what was happening in the Hill District at this time, because the Jewish community was also centered there. So how did yeah. the two communities uh, relate or have any interplay at all? Yeah, I mean, those were those were two different communities in the same way that everybody in Homestead thought of themselves as being in this like separate entity from Pittsburgh. Um, you know, the identities in all those places, all those little, by which I mean all these little steel town boroughs were, were very inward looking. They <laughs> identified very much with where they, they lived, mostly because travel wasn't what it is today or, you know, they weren't hopping on the streetcar and going back and forth every day or certainly not in their cars. Um, so um, the Jewish community in the Hill District was the center for of Jewish population in some of this earlier history. And in many cases, you find families where a branch was in Homestead and a branch was in the Hill District and a branch was in Beaver Falls and a branch was in Aliquippa. I mean, you've got these families like my great grandfather had seven brothers and sisters who came over. They end up in all different towns looking for their opportunities. So. Certainly they would have had connections there. Uh, there was kosher food available in Homestead to an extent, but there were probably other Jewish goods and services that they were getting in the Hill District. Um, so we know that there were some relationships like merchants in these mill towns would go to Fifth Avenue, um, so kind of adjacent to the Hill, um, which is where they would buy their goods and kind of, especially merchants from towns further afield than Homestead, kind of catch up on Jewish news and happenings and things. So you do have these relationships, but they were they were two very distinct, uh, very distinct communities. I think the last thing I can say about that is that the rabbis who were considered the leading rabbis of the Jewish congregations that were in that time at the Hill played a sort of like chief rabbi of Western Pennsylvania aspect at times. And so in some of the like particularly tense moments of homestead history, you hear about Rabbi Ashinsky, if any of you know that this name, like he comes out to homestead to try to like deal with a thing that has happened. Or if they're, they want to invite honored guests, they'll invite the rabbis of, of the synagogues in Pittsburgh. So they had that kind of relationship as well. But uh, homes, the homestead Jewish community, until you get to the later decades, was very much an entity under itself, unto itself, part of this network of all of these like independent and yet connected Jewish communities that were just like a constellation over all of Western Pennsylvania, this whole region. Thanks. Okay. So uh, you had spoken about the Jewish merchants being leaders in the community or in the heyday yeah. of, of Homestead's Jewish community. What can you tell us about what those Jewish merchants or, or even the synagogue did to help non-Jews in the community? Oh, good. Um, I When I was trying to adjust this talk for time, I edited some of that out. So whoever asked that question, thank you. Um, I can add in some of the stuff that I wanted to say, but wasn't quite sure how to make it all fit. Um, I mentioned that um, in these early decades, the way that places dealt with 
local poverty was the local business leaders getting together and saying like, let's raise some money, whether they had some kind of function or they simply exhorted everybody to like come by so-and-so's store and like drop off money, whatever it was. Um, they organized these kinds of efforts and they did it really very publicly. They would print in the newspaper the names of the people who donated. So I can see exactly who donated and when, uh, Jews and non-Jews to be clear. Um, you could see which people they were choosing to lead these efforts. And so you would see some of the same Jewish names of the leading shopkeepers showing up again and again, alongside obviously a greater number of non-Jewish leaders in the town who are leading these efforts. And so, um, you know, whether it was, you know, like pulling together money to then open a soup kitchen, which operated for a short period of time during a particular downturn um, for the steel industry when, you know, men were either not working or not able to work full time. You see that going on. I showed you from the hospital movement, you know, they certainly would get solicited by all different organizations. Uh, some of my favorite records that I have come across, which I was not able to share in this talk, are programs from different community organizations, in particular ones from Hungarian and Slovakian non-Jewish church groups who were putting on plays and went around to all the different merchants to get advertisements, same as we do now. And so I see there some Hungarian language advertisements for Jewish merchants in Homestead, including the only advertisement for my own great grandfather, because he had a saloon and his saloon catered towards his fellow Hungarians. It was for people who spoke Hungarian. It was named after Hungarian hero. He spoke Hungarian, the patron spoke Hungarian, the ad was in host Hungarian. So, um, you know, somebody went to his saloon or went to him and said, hey, like, help us out here. Um, there was a famous mine explosion in Cheswick, um, not far from here. And um, it uh, resulted in the catastrophic death of like half of one of the Hungarian congregations. And so I know from the newspaper that it was actually my great grandfather. They called him a big hearted Hebrew. Um, he was the one who organized a fundraising effort amongst Jewish and non Jewish Hungarians to provide for these many, many families who had lost their their breadwinners. So you see things on like the level of the town, you see things on the level of the individual and everything in between. I don't want to get carried away because it clearly wasn't enough. People still lived really awful lives, like especially those like lowest immigrant laborers in the mill. Um, so, you know, there was nothing that could be done on the individual level. And I also don't want to discount the role of their own churches and community organizations in helping address those concerns. I mean, it's a separate story from the one that I'm telling here, but that's certainly part of the fabric. I think the piece of it that I'm trying to reclaim is that Yes, charity in those days looked kind of paternalistic, but within the values of what that day was, people were making real efforts to try to make a difference. It wasn't enough. You know, we needed a union. <laughs> we needed fair wages. But it was it was something that that was a theme of the ways that people in Homestead tried to live with the things that they could not change in the pre-union era. Great. Well, thank you so much. I hate to cut you off, and there are actually more questions. So I will be happy to keep the, the Zoom line open, but we want to do a couple of things first um, in terms of the organizational announcements. I just want to say before we let you go um, how very, very much we appreciate um, your presentation here today your presence in the community, your expertise, your unbelievable skill, and your support of the organization. Really, you you describe the organization as we see it, and that's really great. Um, I'm going to now ask Jackie Cavalier or Larry to give us some really exciting news um, for the Battle of Homestead Foundation. I'm not sure who's going to I'm here. I'm here. Hi. Susan. Hi, everyone. And Tammy, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, really informative and wonderful. And I can't wait to share the link once the recording is available, because I know so many people that will be interested um, in the presentation and your information. So thank you. Um, I think it's evident from Tammy's fabulous presentation, how important documents and records and images are to research. So I am, to say elated is an understatement. Um, I am just so happy to share that we have 
pulled off a tremendous feat as a small nonprofit organization. As many of you know, in the Battle of Homestead Foundation in 2019, we created a committee for the development of an uh, Battle of Homestead Foundation archives and special collections. We began by focusing on three specific collections, those of Dr. Charles McAllister, Mike Stout, and the third being Mark Fallon. We hired two staff members initially, Sinead Bly and Callie Sheets, to begin the process of inventorying and cataloging those collections. We secured a space in Guardian Storage and Homestead, and we pursued grant monies to hire more staff, purchase equipment, supplies, etc. In fact, we're a very proud recipient of the Rivers of Steel grant for community archives so that we were able to continue our work. Under the leadership of the archives administrator, Cassidy Knott, we hired two additional interns, uh, Delina Collins and Zach Adams. And initially, what we always envisioned for the uh, Battle of Homestead Foundation archives and special collections, um, especially me as committee chair, was an uh, electronic access. Um, so I cannot contain my excitement in announcing here tonight that the first collection, that of Dr. Charles McAllister, has been fully digitized and is now searchable on the Pennsylvania Power Library for all of the world to see. Um, so I'm going to share, I hopefully I'm going to share my screen. Yes, hang on one second. Um, and I will go quickly because, again, after such a wonderful presentation and, and so many great uh, questions and answers um, discussion tonight, I don't want to belabor um, your time. So let me just, here we go. Um, so the Pennsylvania Power Library, um, uh, certainly it reflects the painstaking work that was conducted by a very small staff of archivists under the leadership of Cassidy Knott. Um, they scanned images, they uh, digitized according to very, very specific requirements, they created descriptors. Uh, for a searchable database. Um, they identified categories and subcategories and the list goes on. So no longer are these pictures and documents, um, elements of material culture, no longer are they tucked away in a box. They are preserved in perpetuity and they help to expand our mission as a people's history um, by uh, preserving this information and certainly making it accessible to researchers and scholars and academics and labor history enthusiasts. So I'll just give you a quick um, show here. I clicked on Dr. Charles McAllister. Hopefully you're all seeing the Battle of Homestead Foundation, Charles McAllister collection. About this collection is the information. And then you will see anything that you click on. It will take you, of course, to that item. That item has been scanned, certainly digitized. You can make it larger, you can make it smaller, whether it is a document, whether it is an image. And then of course, um, as you look at the record itself, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I keep, I'm gonna pull up one uh, other. When you get to the record itself, all of the necessary information um, that identifies this particular record is readily available. Um, and so uh, Charlie's um, collection, uh, as you can see, as I'm navigating through here, um, contains uh, 219 items um, that are researchable, um, again, by uh, researchers and scholars and labor history enthusiasts, and the list goes on. And so I know that Larry McCullough has been instrumental in promoting uh, uh, this information on the Facebook page, and we will definitely have a link on the website. And um, I'm just, again, very, very excited. And I cannot think, uh, thank, excuse me, our team enough 
for all of the work that they uh, conducted on um, just accomplishing this goal. It's just amazing to me, but it certainly is proof that a small, a relatively small uh, um, uh, nonprofit organization can do really big things. Um, so look for the additional collections. There's more to come and the Battle of Homestead Foundation will certainly have a tremendous presence on the Pennsylvania Power Library. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Jackie, so much. And what Jackie neglected to say is that she has been the chairperson of the Archives Committee and has worked tirelessly um, with the paid staff in order to get this done. Uh, her work does not stop in this regard, and we are very grateful to her for that. So now I'm going to let Larry McCullough have the last word. Larry? <laughs> well, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, for attending this program. We have two more coming up in April. Our next program, in fact, is coming up this very next week, and it is in person. Uh, it is on Saturday, April 1st, Sunday, April 2nd. We are presenting, <coughs> excuse me, a Pennsylvania Labor History Weekend. Uh, it takes place in Winbur and Lily, Pennsylvania. How many have been to Winbur and Lily, Pennsylvania lately? Um, they're actually pretty accessible, maybe about an hour, an hour and a half east of Pittsburgh. These are two small towns where a century ago, some very big things happened. In 1922 and 1923, the United Mine Workers of America had a 16, 16 month strike for union recognition. The center of that strike, which made international news was in Winbur, the little borough there in Somerset County. In 1924, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, as we've talked a little bit about, we're on a campaign throughout the northern United States to attack and intimidate immigrants in small towns. On April 5th, 1924, they came to Lilly, Pennsylvania in Cambria County, and they were made to feel very unwelcome by the local townspeople who drove them back onto their trains and literally railroaded them out of town. So both April 1st and 2nd this year are going to be filled with panels, discussions, site tours, visits to some of the monuments that commemorate these events from the 1920s. And the full schedule uh, for both these days with all the speakers is gonna be on our, uh, it's on our Battle of Homestead website. There's also gonna be live music. Uh, Tom Breeding is gonna play April 1st uh, in Winbur and Jason Kendall is gonna perform music celebrating these, uh, these events in slavery history and Lily on the next day, April 2nd. Um, on Thursday, April 20th at 7.30 p.m., we have an in-person event at the Pump House and Homestead. We'll also be Zooming it, but I think you'll wanna be there if you can. It's called Jazz and Working Class Experience. It is a book talk with poetry and live music. Uh, BHF member and local author, Nicole McCandless, will introduce her children's book, Down on James Street. And that was based on a real historical incident in 1930s Pittsburgh on the North Side right by James Street, uh, in which there was a dance, public dance, that was broken up by the police because it was attended by teenagers who were both black and white. Um, and this book tells the history from the teenager's point of view uh, and talks about the politics uh, of the time. And Nicole will be here on April 20th at the Pump House to discuss the feedback she's gotten since the book was published. Uh, Fred Shaw is gonna be a poet uh, there. He is a poet of renown. I think a lot of you maybe know him. And he will read poems from his book, Scraping Away, uh, as well as some new works. Fred re frequently uh, writes about working class topics and jazz. And the whole event is going to be accompanied by Ken Foley's Stepping Stone Jazz Quartet. Uh, Ken uh, is an instructor, a great drummer, uh, teaches down at Duquesne University. Uh, so he'll be there. And if you'd like info on the, Nicole's book down on James Street, it is uh, on her website, NicoleMcCandless.com, also on Hardball Press. The program committee meets every couple of weeks, and um, we are still planning additional programs all throughout the year. We've got a couple films, a couple more book events, uh, maybe some more live music events. Um, we would love to have you consider joining the Battle of Homestead Foundation as a member, because that's really the best way to know about, about what's happening. You can also donate to the general fund. Uh, go to the website where it says Become a Member, or join our mailing list. And also on the website, you'll find out about our planned Center for the History and Future of Work. Uh, 
And that is something we've been planning for a while. It is envisioned to be a museum, uh, a teaching space, uh, permanent archives with the mission of inspiring young people to use lessons from our, our industrial history uh, that address today's workforce challenges of equity, diversity, and fair labor practice. Uh, but not just for young people, really anybody, anybody can uh, be involved with the center. So we actually have plans for it uh, up on the website. Uh, take a look. Let us, let us know what you think and uh, any ways you might want to pitch in and help. I think that's all we have to report for tonight. Uh, anything else you'd like to share, John? Anybody else? Um, thanks again to our speaker, thank Tammy Epps. Um, thanks to all of you for attending. We hope to see you maybe next week. Some of you at Windburn. Lily, I'm hoping it's nice, fair, balmy spring weather for being outside. Um, and once again, thanks, us, thanks for helping us tell all these stories. Uh, thank you, Larry, and thank you so much, Tammy, and thank you, Suzanne, and all the other committee members. Uh, it was a great program, and um, it's it's wonderful to see uh, so many folks participating. And you will always be welcome at our breakfasts every Wednesday at the Eaton Park in Homestead. And um, you got to get up early uh, from eight to 10. Uh, we're there from nine to 10. We actually uh, turn the cameras on and zoom the meeting so we can accommodate about 20 people live and uh, and, uh, and an, an infinite number of people on Zoom if, you, if uh, you'd like to participate. And I promise you that everybody won't be speaking at once and we can hear what you say and you can hear what we say on, on that Zoom meetings. Thanks mostly to Suzanne and Nathan and other people that are perfecting this technology. So everybody, thank you so much. Tammy, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have uh, such resources available in our town. And it's, a, it's another reason why uh, we believe that the resources that are being accrued uh, through historical inquiry um, are, are uh, an invaluable asset to what's been happening in our town the last three or four years. And that is that more people are joining unions, more people are voting uh, for uh, the new ideas that may be that um, we don't always have to live with um, a tax system that favors the wealthy. We don't always have to live with an educational system that isn't funded equally throughout our communities. And we don't always have to live with politicians that rely on patronage and old boy networks to accomplish uh, their goals. And I think we're beginning to see results, folks. And it all starts with knowing your history and where you wanna go, learning that all this stuff that we didn't realize or weren't taught in schools is um, where the truth begins to be told. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll see you again. Uh, thank you for uh, being part of this solidarity community and thank you for contributing. Come on and join us. Uh, we'd like to work with you. Take care. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you all for being there.